Hey everyone, in this video I want to show you a comparison between Flask, Django, and FastAPI. We'll be building an application with each, and as we're building those applications, I'll tell you some of the advantages and why we might want to use that specific framework for our application. Let's jump right in. Before we begin going through each one of these, I just want to say that there's no single best one. Each one is very strong in its own use case. Knowing the differences between them and knowing when to use them is very important. Let's get started, and our first example will be with Flask. Flask is very simple, and it's used primarily for microservices. So if you're just building a simple API, or just want to do something simple like render templates, Flask is a great option. I'm building each one of these within Wayscript, which just gives access for you to be able to view my endpoints. It hosts it for us, and it gives you the ability to copy it to your own Wayscript account. This just makes it simple, because I don't have to worry about hosting or anything to set this up. Instead, I can just write the code and get it working to show you. So inside Wayscript, we're within our dev environment here. So this should look very similar to your setup, maybe. I will first create a file. How Flask works is we will have, by default, it will look in a file called app.py. And in this app.py, we will need a few lines of code. I will pull those over. So a very simple Flask application will just look like this. So what we have here is we have the import of Flask. If you're doing this locally and you do not have Flask installed, the command will just be pip install Flask. And that should get Flask loaded on your local machine. You might want to use a virtual environment locally if you want to do that. Wayscript handles that for me, so I don't have to worry about it. Once you have that installed, we have that import into our file. We're creating our app. Then how Flask works is we can set our routes with this decorated app.route. This will be our homepage in this example, so just slash. And what happens is the function underneath it runs whenever the user goes to that route. So in this case, our function can be named whatever, and the only logic we have is to return hello world, a string to the user. Finally, we just want to run our application whenever this file is called. And that's all the code we need for a Flask app. So as you see, when we're talking about microservices, Flask is a great example because it has very low overhead. We don't have a lot of imports and we can just get this up and running to do what we need very quickly. Now, it doesn't come with the most tools. It's a very bare bones application, but if we need something simple, we can get it done in just a few minutes. Just to show you the final steps of hosting this within Wayscript, Wayscript can host this for us. That way you can view this application at the link in the description. To run your Flask application locally, it will just be Flask run. Here, I need to expose this just by the way Wayscript works. Flask run, and I'm exposing it with this host command here. We'll match the port to the one we're setting manually. And now we can click this test button. We'll save all, and I will pull this up. I'm just doing this so you can go to this URL and see it for yourself. And all this code will be on GitHub, so you can copy it there too if you want to. As you see, we have just 12 lines of code and a working application ready to go to do whatever we need. Now, creating APIs of Flask is very simple. Instead of just returning a string here, what we can do if we want a JSON response to go back to the user, we can use curly brackets and then just something like data and data to send. And that's all it would take for this to be sent back as a JSON response and we have a working API in just a few seconds. So that's pretty much it for Flask. It's just a good microservice framework that we can get things built very rapidly with very low overhead. So our next framework that we'll cover is called Fast API, and it is a step up in complexity compared to a Flask one. Flask is very bare bones, so it's very simple, but Fast API has a few more steps, but they're very simple and it is very worth it to learn how to use it. Fast API is a very good framework for creating APIs that are super performant. We'll talk about how Fast API is very performant here in a few seconds when we build the application. However, one thing to know is Python is a pretty slow language compared to others because it is dynamically typed. Dynamically typed just means that when we create a variable, we don't have to say what that variable's type is. So here we can just say variable A is equal to this string. And we don't have to declare that it is a string type. Instead, Python figures that out and infers the type here. So that is pretty cool. Saves us time when typing out the code. However, it makes our programs a little bit slower compared to other languages. One of the core features of Fast API is that we do have to declare the types of the variables that we're expecting within the API 
but this speeds up our program and makes it more responsive and our API perform better. Inside of our new layer, we will build this application. I have some sample code already typed up for us. How this one works is our file will be called main.py and our code will look something like this. So as you see, there's some similarities between Flask and FastAPI. You see here that we have our imports from FastAPI. If you need to install these, it will be the same way that we installed Flask. So pip install FastAPI. Walking through our code a little bit, we will skip over this and come back to this in just a moment. To begin our app, we have app equals FastAPI. This initializes it the same way as before, where we have this decorated app, we will have that. A difference here is that instead of saying dot route on a Flask application, we instead use dot and then the method that we're accepting at that endpoint. So what this is saying is we're accepting a get request at our home page here. A, another example is this final one where we are accepting a post request at our endpoint that ends slash items slash. So this is just a way to define what type of request we're expecting at that endpoint. Our homepage in this example is pretty standard, should make sense compared to the Flask one. It's almost the same thing. Then on this one, you see here that we're accepting a variable within our URL string. And with FastAPI, we have to define that variable type inside of our endpoint using something that looks like this. Finally, the very important one here is our post request. So as you see, we're accepting a post at this endpoint slash items. This is where our class item comes into place. So normally what we would have to do if we were accepting a post request within a different framework other than FastAPI, we would have to have logic in place to go through our payload and look at the different types within that payload. If they were not the type we wanted, we'd have to convert them. In FastAPI's case, all we have to do is to create this class up top that looks like this. And whenever a user sends us a payload that includes a name that is not a string, they will get back an error. So what this is doing is it's looking at the payload. It's erroring back anything that doesn't have the information with the appropriate type connected to it. So if we sent a name that was a number in this case to this endpoint, our fast API would automatically error and send it back to the user saying that it is an improper payload. This is a pretty big deal because this logic is not included with Flask or Django. So if we were to do the same thing in Flask or Django, we would have to type all that logic out for every endpoint that we had. And that's a huge benefit of Fast API. Not only does it handle all that logic, but it makes our API response faster because we know the type and we don't have to infer types as we go through. This is a huge advantage. And I have a full video on how to create Fast API APIs down below. So feel free to check it out if you want to go through and create this very same code and application. One final benefit of FastAPI before we move on is FastAPI auto documents your API for you. This is huge whenever you're creating applications and you need to be very agile on how you do it because you don't have to worry about docs. They are created for you and they look pretty clean. Our final framework that we'll be talking through in this video is called Django. Django is the most complex of these three However, that is with good reason. That is because they give you a bunch of pre-built tools that you can use and you don't have to create yourself. So creating another layer. And like I said, to reiterate, all of these will be on GitHub and linked down below if you want to check them out. Doing this locally, you'll probably want a virtual environment. Like I said before, Wayscript handles this for me. So this one will be pip3 install Django admin. And that will install the Django library for you. Once you add that, you will need a command, something like Python make Django admin start project project, and then whatever you want your project to be named. The default that they use in their documentation is my site, and then you would execute this. What that will do is create some code, and that code I will pull in so we can view it within Wayscript here. Once that loads, we'll give it just a second here. To give you a brief list of advantages of Django, we might want to use Django when we're creating an application that has many different parts to it or is pretty complex. This is because when we create a Django application, we're creating a project, and within that project, we can create different apps to do different features of our site. 
So you can imagine that you have a project for a blog website, then you have an app to create posts or a forum. Each one of these apps within your Django project gives you different tools that you can use and helps speed up the workflow. Another thing to consider whenever creating a Django application is your team size. That may sound weird. However, if you want to go through and create best practices for yourself, you certainly can. However, there are already best practices implemented within a Django application. Those best practices aren't something that usually exists within a very bare bones framework such as Flask. Django, people have already been using it and have hit the issues that you're likely to hit. And those best practices have already been developed, which is pretty critical if you want to have a big team all working on the same project. There's plenty of tools that are built into a Django app. And one important one is a admin panel. An admin panel just gives you access to all the administrative tasks that you may need within your application. With all of that said, let's walk through our Django app here. So you see that we have a manage.py and the my site subdirectory within my site. So going through these, none are too important other than your settings and urls.py. So within settings, you will have all your application settings. Having this level of control is pretty cool. And you can see that we have important settings throughout the settings.py file. One setting that we'll be using in getting this hosted on a third-party website is the allowed hosts, if we can find it. So allowed host, we will have to input our host that we want to host our Django application on within this setting. The other file that is important is this one, urls.py. This gives us the ability to create sub url.py files and include them here. These will determine the routes that a user can go to and what information they receive back from our application. So with all of this, we will just run the standard Django application with our manage.py file. We'll use the same hosting method on Wayscript, deploy. And in this example, what I will actually need to do is I will create a requirements.txt on Wayscript. This is just to get this software working. So you will not need to do this locally. We'll include Django in that. And our command to run is going to be pip install. We'll read in the requirements.txt. Then we have another command in terminal. We can do that with two and signs. And our second command will be to run our server on an exposed port, on an exposed host on a port. So host this time will be 8,000. And now we'll click run and we should be able to view this within a web page. So we'll go ahead and open that up and we see that we get an error here. This is that one step I was talking about earlier in our settings.py. So you see that it is not allowed at this host. We will take our endpoint that Wayscript is providing us settings.py and we will include it in that bracket. We'll save that and we will try it again. So. This should get this up and running. All these commands for my deploy trigger will be linked in the description and we will refresh. We'll give it just a second to get everything deployed. And you see that Django is automatically hosted for us. To recap Django, if you're building a large scale project with many team members that has a bunch of functionality, then you probably want to use Django because a lot of the tools are already built into the framework for you. That's not to say you can't go back into a Flask application and create these for yourself. However, it does take time. And the more custom logic you code, the harder it is to train new people and bring them onto the project. So it can be done. Should you do it is completely up to you, but this tool does exist for your toolkit. To end this video off, to recap my personal preferences here, if I'm creating a microservice that has very limited functionality, with some custom logic, I use Flask 100% of the time to create a very performant API that I want documentation for. Fast API is hands down the best one to use. And any application that has many working components to it, I use Django for that. So feel free to use whatever you would like. Hopefully this video is helpful. And if you have any questions, please let us know and we'll be happy to help. Until next time.